Greetings. Uh, thank you so very much for inviting us to join the SA Large Heads Conference, uh, an important gathering which we would have liked to attend it in person after having uh, been through two years of COVID-19. Nonetheless, we are glad that we are still able to share these reflections with you in the topic of today where I would like to reflect on how to broaden farm ownership for successful transformation in South Africa's agricultural sector. And this is an important topic because in South Africa, we have an agricultural economy that has seen tremendous growth over time. If you look at South Africa's agricultural sector between today and 1994, this is a sector that has more than doubled. And there's a lot that has been behind that. Uh, improvement in productivity, in exports have been really at the core of that growth uh, in South Africa's agricultural sector. And this has been widespread across all of the subsectors of the industry. You look at the growth in horticulture in the very same industry that we are in, in the dairy industry or livestock in general, in as far as the output, the numbers have been relatively good. And of course, in the field crops, we have seen improvements in productivity. But the one key thing that is at the core or defining factor of South Africa's agricultural economy is the fact that this growth is usually one-sided when one looks at it into the racial perspective. And this is something that is linked to our history as a country. Uh, black farmers remain somewhat at the periphery of that progress that we are seeing, which is what then we are stuck with, this dualism in South Africa's agricultural sector, where you have a large scale, mainly commercial white farmers and relatively medium or small scale black farmers. And there's a lot of government policies that have been put in place over the years to say, how do we correct this challenge so that we have a unified and really progressive agricultural economy? And you look back from 1995 up until this year, in fact, there's a range of policies that have been put in place. 1995, we have a white uh, paper on agricultural policy with a Strauss uh, Commission report. And over the years, Agri-Parks Initiative, Operation Pakisa, and most recently, we have what we call is the agriculture and the agro-processing master plan. But there's one key challenge in all of these plans, which is the implementation. We seem to be lacking on the implementation. And after every period, we look back, we say we haven't made progress. Perhaps let's come up with another plan. And all of these plans just keep accumulating. We also see that there is a challenge around the monitoring um, uh, and evaluation of saying what is constraining uh, the government and the private sector from implementing, implementing some of these other plans and what should be done to correct all of those challenges that we do see in the sector. And as a result of all of these, if you look at the production of South Africa's agriculture and you really segment it into say, what is the share within the commercial output that is produced by the black farmers? You see numbers that are really um, uh, need to be improved over time. And in fact, the industry that we are in today uh, has made more progress than any other subsector of South Africa's agricultural sector. If you look at the cattle industry, about 34% or so is owned in the commercial space by black farmers. But in other subsectors of the economy, there's still uh, room for improvement um, onto that. And we hope that in the next couple of years, partnerships will be at the root of all of that progress. But unfortunately, in the near term, uh, this dualism that we do see in agriculture in a production level does lead also to a somewhat fragmented political economy in our country. And in fact, you see this in the broader politics, but also in the politics of agriculture where we have a range of farmer organization. And if you were to look at them on a racial terms, they still to a certain extent also resemble, I would say, uh, part of the fragments of our history. And in fact, one perhaps would have liked to see even a united farming um, association in South Africa, something that uh, in the past we tried to do with what we called the ASUF, Agri-Sector Unity Forum. We think that structures like that would still be effective um, in driving progress. Of course, uh, people associate in their preferences, but the core issue with many farmer organization is the fact that that tends to be somewhat of a bit of misalignment when one thinks about what policies do they advocate for, 
what government is putting on the table. And all of this, to an extent, contributes to that slow implementation or maybe a lack of united vision to an extent with some of the crucial policies that we do need uh, when we are trying to make progress in South Africa. And of course, one of those policies that has been on the center, which is a topic that you see in your programs in the table there, it's around the story about land reform, uh, where of course, former association have had their views uh, into how land reform should be done in South Africa, and political parties have had their varying views about how land reform should be done in South Africa. And many people know the reasons why land reform should be done in South Africa because of those historical dynamics that I won't delve into today. But in a more contemporary term, we did see land reform coming up um, uh, a lot, is particularly after 2017, December of the ANC's policy conference where there were proposals that we should actually as a country go and amend section 25 of the constitution to accommodate expropriation without compensation of particular pieces um, of land as a way to drive uh, perhaps progress on a land on a land reform that process followed through all of the legal uh, uh, processes that needs to be done in parliament at least and that motion failed it didn't really reach um, or receive enough support for the constitution to be amended and that is an outcome that in our side at agbiz we favors because we felt that uh, all of these arguments for the change in the constitution did not really consider much the broader impact uh, on the economy uh, that it would have. We viewed it as quite negative uh, for, for the economy. And I guess this is why the organizers of this conference, when we began speaking, they gave me a topic where they asked, is farm ownership a requirement for success in South Africa's agricultural context? And on that question, I mean, my broad answer to that is that, of course, uh, farm ownership is important if you're thinking about success in South Africa's agriculture. There are many issues that you do need. Uh, the financial status of a farmer is one of the key things that you have to consider. But I think if you appreciate the fact that farming is a long-term endeavor, and it is capital intensive. Therefore, land ownership or farm ownership gets to be a crucial ingredient um, in that endeavor. And we think that as long as property rights are still protected in the Republic, that is one of the important uh, and, and things uh, of supporting our farming economy. But of course, with all of that in place, the question remains, how should we accelerate land reform so that we build a united uh, farming sector in South Africa? And I think when people raise these questions, they make a mistake of saying there hasn't been any progress in land reform in South Africa. But if you look back at the numbers from 1994 up until to today to say how has actually land purchases by the state and some private purchases actually been over time, you quickly realize that in the 30% target that was sent a couple of years when the ANC government uh, came into power, they said in the next three years or so they want to make sure that 30% of the agricultural land is transferred to black farmers. Of course, that target kept being moved. Now we are looking at it for 2020, um, uh, 2030, which is the NDP target. But if you had to look at it, say, to say, okay, in those hectares, where are we at the moment? Because that 30% in hectare perspective, it was around about 23 million hectares or so. We've now made great improvements where we see that uh, we are somewhere uh, around about 69% of that target. Or if you were to measure it and say 30% in perspective, in percentage perspective, where are we? We're somewhere around about 20% closer to achieving that 30% target. So there has been a, prog a progress. The question though remains, where is that land and is it really being used productively? And I think that's where then we also need to start our debate on to say, let's make sure that all of the land that the government have bought is given to beneficiaries, beneficiaries that are selected properly, and then they are utilizing it uh, productively. At the moment, the answer to that, not all of it is utilized productively. There's a range of reasons for that. Some of them we cover in the paper that you do have, which was distributed, which have to do a lot with the farmer support, with the lack of title deeds, with the lack of infrastructure support, and also even the way some beneficiaries were selected. There are studies that show that those beneficiaries perhaps were not selected in a most fair way um, that one would have desired.
that. And there are policies now in place to correct, of course, all of those challenges. We show in the screen some progress over years, various instruments of land reform in million hectares about how that has been. That's the evolution of the land purchases over time. And of course, land is not the only challenge that is constraining agriculture in South Africa. We categorize ourselves at AgBiz about six top challenges that we think constrain growth in the sector. The inefficiencies in the state administration, particularly in the animal disease side. Everyone that is in the Congress today, conference today, knows about the foot and mouth disease that we are experiencing. It's one such uh, challenge we face. Crop diseases are also a big issue. Act 36, which is the act that uh, regulates the, the, the fertilizers, farm seeds, and the other animal remedies, um, is one that needs some bit of modernization so that we can register new medicine. We can be able to import some of the medicine that we do need for driving productivity in the long term. And the one other thing that cannot be overemphasized is the inefficiencies of the staff complement in some of the departments um, in the provincial, uh, to an extent national, and of course at the municipality level. That's one of the challenges. And I think at the heart of all of this, we also have infrastructural issues in South Africa. And this is very important because South Africa is an export-oriented agricultural sector where we are exporting about half of what we produce in value term. In 2021, that was the agricultural products worth about $12.4 billion. So that needs to be transported uh, 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 across the country and of course to the ports that are operating efficiently. So roads, railway line and ports are the key challenge. And of course, electricity is one of the key issues that we struggle with along with the water infrastructure. And if you look at the farm level, we see a lot of security concerns over the past couple of years. Farm theft, farm vandalization and infrastructure, farm attacks, and even organized crime that is vandalizing our infrastructure, the railway line, if you think about it. Those are all of the key things that we think constrain growth and economic activity in agricultural sector. The uncertainty point around land reform, at least over the past couple of years, it has been a challenge. But when we look forward and what is emerging, which is the point I will get to uh, next, we think that the picture is getting better in as far as land reform. There's a lot that can be done to improve or spend on research um, and development, as well as a need to find more export markets for our agricultural products. And I think at the time that we are uh, having uh, this conference, no one can speak and not acknowledge the challenges of geopolitics. Um, and these for the dairy industry, they come in various ways higher input costs that you do experience uh, because of everything and the disruption that is happening in the grain markets, uh, higher energy costs, uh, uh, again, because of the importance of Russia and Ukraine in that space, and also high fertilizer prices for those that also grow some of their crops for, for feed in, the, in their livestock. So there's a lot of factors that we think that are playing against farming, medium term and the long term. And these top six are the ones that are now cited AgBiz, we think um, are additional constraints to the points that we've mentioned about land reform. Now, that's all very stressful, but when we look forward into what to expect in South Africa's agricultural sector, in the spirit of the very same topic that uh, was uh, given by our colleagues at the MPO in, in reflection on this point, we see a change in policy in South Africa's agriculture. Uh, just a few weeks back, uh, the ruling African National Congress released their policy papers ahead of the conference that is happening at the end of July, and of course, their elective conference um, in the end of the year. In that document, we're beginning to see a change in the messaging at which the ANC is positioning itself. They are acknowledging the importance of agriculture, uh, and this is something that we haven't seen in the recent past. Every now and then, when agriculture is mentioned, it was usually around saying, uh, how should we make sure that there's inclusion in agriculture? And in fact, 2017 was clouded by the very same point I began with, which is expropriation without compensation. But now, agriculture in these new documents is seen as an important sector of the economy for reducing poverty, uh, economic activity, uh, and, 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 and of course, on job creation. 
If you drill down in that document, there's also no mention of expropriation without compensation per se, but rather the document focuses on what it's called Land Reform and Agricultural Development Agency. This is not a new word, of course, for many people, especially South Africans that are in the audience. You've heard this in the State of the Nation address of the president in 2021, and you've heard it most recently in the 2022 SONA. This is an important agency because it begins to look at saying, how do you accelerate land reform working with private sector instead of focusing on all of the points that I, I had started up with? The other important points that are coming out of this policy document is an increased focus on the network industries. By network industries is really at the core of what I mentioned in the previous slide. If you look back at this previous slide, there under infrastructure, I talked about water, I talked about roads, I talked about the ports. And now you fast forward, you look into what is coming out of the ANC policy. They talk about roads, water, electricity, and the ports as the area of focus that they wanna, they wanna look at. And they also look at the rural economy in a more interesting way now acknowledging that rural development is multidimensional. You need to improve social cohesion, improve infrastructure, improve governance um, in general. And we think all of those, at least in our interpretation at AGBIS, are those are important uh, things. That land uh, reform agency and, 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 and agricultural development is important because now if you bring in private sector working with government, you eliminate a lot of bureaucratic red tape, patronage, political influence that hindered uh, the efficiency of land reform in the past few years. More information about this is yet to be released, but our view at ACP is what we would like to see uh, government releasing. And I'm drawing here from a paper I personally co-authored with Professor Johan Kirstein, which is the one that you are hopefully enjoying in your, in your conference pack. It, it, we begin to reflect on saying you need about five broad tasks uh, for this agency which is enabling policy and, 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 and making sure that all of the bureaucratic processes uh, of facilitating land donations are taken out of the state and they are in the agency. And within the agency, you create what we call the, 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 the recognition mechanism. Here, you are creating nudges or incentives to say those that can donate land, these are the benefits that they could get. Here, the land donors, we are looking at churches, we are looking at miners, we are looking at everybody that can add the land supply. Now, this land donation and the land supply adds into some of the pieces of land that I had mentioned, saying the government is acquired. If you look back and you, in your memory in the chart that I had shown, that land is plus two million hectares of land um, that is in the government hands and that uh, this agency can begin to take that land, add the land donation, distribute it to carefully selected beneficiaries. But also this agency can tap in what is called the Land Reform Fund. Land Reform Fund is an idea that comes from the Land Expert Panel of around about 2018, which I was blessed to be part of. And that land reform fund was again of saying, can we collect private sector donations and the other role players and finance industries so that we are able to have money to buy land in the open market rather than going in all of these adventurous policies that have been suggested in the past couple of years. So these are new instruments and new ideas that we would like to see being reflected on this agency. And we think that if they can be done carefully and successfully as we we articulate in the paper, they would begin to move us forward in as far as land reform in South Africa. But those will not only be sufficient uh, for getting the farmer to be able to operate uh, successfully in South Africa. You also need a couple of mechanisms that can support the beneficiaries. Um, and also within that, there are certain principles that you need to set up for the beneficiaries so that they themselves are not corrupted in the process, but the, rather they focus in the business of farming. Uh, there, you're looking at uh, support systems that you give to farmers, making sure that they are not piecemeal support systems, but rather comprehensive support system. If a farmer is in the dairy industry, is really supported working with the likes of the MPO and the other players that are in the sector to help them design what support system does a new entrant farmer in the dairy space need. And then that is couched and they are supported with that. 
and the ways at which they purchase the implements. No public tenders should be out there because the tenders, every South African knows what ends up happening to some of those. Infrastructure needs to be supported. Soft loans are some of the things that needs to be put in place. And of course, machinery and implements can be financed in long-term loans. Here, this is where agribusinesses, banks and the others can come on into the party. So there's a range of instruments that we think we all need to be thinking about on supporting the new entrants in the farming, either it's in the dairy industry, the grain industry, or any other agricultural sector. That being done successfully would build on already solid foundation on South Africa's agriculture. I made the point at the start that this is a sector that has been growing more than doubled since 1994. And in fact, even if you can look at 2010 to 2020 to say how has agriculture performed, the very same industry that we are gathered under here, the animal products, you see yourself, your numbers, double digits, 21% in production volumes, 43% in, in, in gross value. So there's been progress here. We will be building already on solid foundation of growing the agricultural economy. When we look forward, though, to say, where are the areas of expansion? Have we reached the limits? Uh, are we only just going to be switching the owners and dealing with productivity? And on our side, we think that there's still new land that can be tilled and be brought into full production, particularly in provinces of KZN, which is where we are at this morning, uh, uh, Eastern Cape, Limpopo, and, 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 and the parts of Mpumalanga. Those are all areas. And the important part is that if you look on the map on your, on, on your, on your, on your left-hand side of the screen, the green parts of that map are also the high-value areas whereby um, uh, 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 agriculture could do well. The dairy industry is already largely in those areas, and there's still more land there for expansion in those areas. Of course, the, the major constraint to South Africa's agriculture is always the issue of infrastructure. Our farming infrastructure is concentrated in the central parts of the country and all of the areas that were former homeland, homelands still lack uh, when it comes to the infrastructure. So those are improvements that could be made over time when we're thinking about the expansion in agriculture. And indeed, these are points that come up in what is called agriculture and agro-processing master plan. Now, all in all, South Africa has all of these policies, many things that have already been art articulated, but the core thing now is at implementation, which is what we highlighted at the start of this talk to say, context is right, policies are somewhere drafted, not as perfect, but we can learn and improve over time. But we really need to get onto implementation because if we don't implement, it is why we end up with those environments where there's rife political um, uh, and social dynamics leading to questions like the topic of my presentation today, where to say, what to do with farm ownership? Is it necessary? Should we all be owning farm? All of those political economic questions arise because, in part, of the low implementation of the policies that we do have. So, in closing, farm ownership is important, um, and in South Africa is a better example of, uh, uh, of, of this because land reform has been central on our debates. But of course, we know that as a collateral, um, and, and at this point, we are happy the fact that we have a constitution that protects the property rights. And we think that all of the colleagues that are in the meeting today should really support that land reform agency that will be launched because it could be an instrument that could help us drive land reform without going in all of the dangerous paths that have been debated in the past couple of years. For colleagues from government, really ensuring that the municipalities work better and the network industries do well is something that we need to focus on. The master plan is important, but some have said it is too cumbersome. Then if it's indeed too cumbersome, we really need to focus on low hanging fruits of saying the Department of Agriculture, Land Reform and Rural Development has to work efficiently in regulations. Roads and water has to be attended to. Electricity and finance by getting the land bank um, into order. That needs to be, to, to be attended to. And of course, at the land bank, we are happy because when we look at the new board that has been put in place and the engagements that they are having with their various partners, we are hopeful that they will be able to turn that institution around. And in the next couple of years, we could see the land bank playing even a more visible path within the South African agricultural economy. So 
This is really how we see and we view things uh, from the AGBIS perspective. And these insights draws from the paper that you do have there again in your pack, which I've co-authored with Professor Johan Kerstin of Stellenbosch University and the Bureau of Economics Research, which is the BER. From the AGBIS side, I'm very thankful for the opportunity to share these views, thankful to the colleagues at the MPO and all of the dairy producers of South Africa and the world that are gathered uh, in person and virtually um, in this SA Large Herds Conference. Thank you so very much for the opportunity to speak.